to Signum Academy on Twitch. This is Wesley. It looks like it's kind of working, so that's good. Oh man. This month of April 2020, we're going to look at Madeline Langle and the so called Time Quintet. Uh, it's one I am not as familiar with, even uh, as I am with Lewis and Tolkien, which, as I've emphasized before, I am by no means an expert in either. So this one's a bit of a stretch for me. Um, but I really love the original book, at least A Wrinkle in Time. I have read a few times now. And um, I don't know when I first read it, but I did read it as a kid. And I've recently reread it in preparation for uh, doing a short talk about it today. Um, I want to remind you all that we've got a ton of great material by people who do know these books really well. Um, and that is on our website. You can find it by searching Signum University, Mythgard, and Signum Academy, and all of that will point you towards um, some great discussions that are pre-recorded. So from a few summers ago now, uh, when we last ran these courses live, um, they're great resources uh, for kids and for those parents out there who want to just brush up on it and then maybe you can adapt uh, and give your sort of insights um, with your kids. That That's probably a good way to do it too. Um, so the course on this um, Book of Wrinkle in Time was a really great one uh, with a lot of interaction um, and it is all recorded on YouTube. You can find it through our website. Um, signumuniversity.org slash academy is where you want to go for that. Um, so in this review of the material, uh, what stood out to me was all of the different allusions that Madeline Langle makes. And they're to all sorts of different things. Um, these are references or, or kind of callbacks that she's making um, in her writing. Uh, and in things that the characters say to one another, she's relating together huge worlds of science and technology on the one hand, and art and literature on the other. Um, bridging the two, uh, though, is this idea of, of illusion, of pointing back, of making a reference relevant in the moment. Um, and of course, the great... Uh, the great master of the illusions in her book um, is Mrs. Who. Mrs. Who's name is fun since when you hear it, um, you're kind of saying that every time she talks. Uh, she is always referencing somebody, but uh, it's not always clear at first who it is she's referencing. Um, of course, all of the, the witches uh, in the book have the the names of question words as well. Um, so she fits in with, uh, within her sisterhood, but also within this other idea of, um, of asking, who the heck uh, is she talking about? Um, and this was a theme that I, I kind of brought up um, with Tolkien and Lewis too. Was what a fun way it um, way to get into these books it, it is to look back at the things that they are reading and kind of brushing off and updating and bringing into their story and making interesting connections to. Um, with Madeline Langle, this happens from the very first page. Um, she uses the phrase, it was a dark and stormy night, kind of the classic story opening phrase up there with um, once upon a time and, and that sort of thing, right? Um, this is the kind of setting that we're thrown into from the very start, a setting that is very consciously, very kind of in your face, a story, right? It was a dark and stormy night. We know, or we think we know what kind of story we're going to get, right? Something with a lot of adventure, with some, uh, some thrills, some suspense, maybe even some scary moments. Um, those are always pretty fun stories. And, um, and then she gradually throws in more and more references. And pretty quickly we get the sense that this is not actually all that familiar a story. Um, 
it's a very strange story. It's a very unusual story. Uh, this picture of her, obviously, um, she looks sort of wise and sort of humorous. Um, and that's the, the voice that I think comes across in her writing. There's a famous story about this book, um, A Wrinkle in Time, about the uh, publication of it, that she uh, wrote it and submitted it and submitted it to publisher after publisher, and they all turned it down. Um, they thought it was too difficult. They thought it was too uh, too weird, you know, too strange, too different, um, and that people wouldn't get it. Um, and they were proved completely wrong. I mean, it's uh, it's a classic right up there with Tolkien and Lewis uh, and the likes of Harry Potter nowadays. Um, so <laughs> some of the things that she throws at us in the first few chapters, just at very up front here, uh, the name of the dog is Fortinbras. Fortinbras um, is a quasi-historical figure, um, f famously uh, a bit part in the Shakespeare play Hamlet, I think. Uh, is the name of the the, the invading army uh, general and the prince of the other country, Norway, I think. Could be getting that mixed up. Um, we get some words out of the dictionary uh, from Charles Wallace. He's been learning new words, uh, such as inadvertently sport, not like the game kind of sport, uh, like football, but sport as in a, a odd... Um, offspring, an unusual biological uh, result that you might not expect. And the word compulsion, which I think is kind of an important word in this book. Uh, actually, maybe all of those are, as we're sort of talking about this theme of surprise and unexpectedness. Um, those all three sort of relate to that. Um, they, uh, they compel us in the way that the ring, remember, we talked about sort of compels and controls. Um, compulsion's a big theme as well as you get into the later part of the book, of course, in the world of Kamazots, where everything is very uh, compelled, uh, very, very forced, very controlled. Um, but she throws that at us right up front, right? So she's teaching us words. She's making historical slash literary references. The next one comes from Pascal, who is one of the great uh, mathematicians as well as religious thinkers. Um, you've probably heard of Pascal's Triangle, and uh, he has some great mathematical writings and theories and such. But he also has this book that's just called Thoughts, Pensées. Pensées in French is thoughts, essentially. is Sometimes it's not even translated. Um, and it's just him, him figuring out what he thinks about some really deep questions about religion in particular. And, um, and so the quote she gives here, the heart has its reasons. And this comes in the chapter where... Um, Meg and Calvin are kind of getting to know each other and, and are out in the woods. Um, and this is, the I think, maybe the first uh, reference that Miss Who makes um, is to Pascal. So that's kind of interesting in that you see that, that connection between the literature and the math and science kind of side, how they fit together really nicely. And, um, and also how the book is, is opening itself up to other languages and other cultures, which I think is a really amazing um, uh, result, a, a really amazing uh, unexpected flowering that comes out of this book, um, it opens up the reader to worlds that they're not planning on engaging with them when they read a, a, an adventure story, right? Worlds of math and science, also worlds of French literature and religious history and, and Shakespeare's plays. Um, we hear about Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, and we're all pretty, I think, familiar with that, but we're seeing it in a pretty strange light because um, it's being kind of applied to permit uh, this incredible mode of transportation um, that we're going to talk about a little bit more in a minute. And of course, I couldn't uh, pass by, I think, 
really one of my favorite um, literary allusions or you know themes of of mythological storytelling has to do with the Garden of Eden story. Um, we saw it last time with C.S. Lewis's book, um, where in the magician's nephew they they go to a kind of garden, um, and the cover of that often has that apple on it, right? So um, the classic image of the apple in the garden is pretty subtle in this book actually it's it's not one that somebody is telling us is a reference um, but I think that it's uh, pretty clearly referencing that Garden of Eden story we have Megan Calvin again uh, just in the garden and talking and getting to know each other and um, getting to know themselves actually which I think is what that story is is mostly about um, is about uh, growing up right and self-knowledge um, there's a ton of references in this book uh, in short we get a world opened up to us a world of learning uh, so as far as ch children's books go um, there, there's very few I think that um, can lead the reader in as many really interesting and powerful directions as a wrinkle in time. Um, so when we think about this as an adventure story, it is that. I mean, the characters go on an adventure, and um, and it's a really strange and wonderful one. But it's also an intellectual adventure. Um, sorry, I'm out of practice with talking since I hardly see anybody these days. Uh, an intellectual adventure in the sense that the reader is exposed and shown all of these worlds of literature, history, and science and math. and It's, it's just a, it's a tremendous um, feat of storytelling. Um, all that from just a dark and stormy night, right? Um, so let me, let me pop back over and see just on the off chance we've got some live questions and stuff all right looks like we're doing good <laughs> all right cool at any time that you feel like you want to ask a question go for it and I will I'll eventually check back over and and, and pick it up for you um, these are the other books in the series um, now, A Wrinkle in Time, as far as I know, is referencing a part of the story that's in the book, right? It's uh, not, I, I don't think it's referencing something outside of the book. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But I did find out that these other titles all reference something else. A Wind in the Door is a line from a uh, King Arthur story, I think. Um, Many Waters is a line from the Bible again um, many waters cannot quench love it says in the Song of Songs or Song of Solomon a swiftly tilting planet um, so these are kind of out of order I'm afraid um, but a swiftly tilting planet is from a less well-known poet um, an American poet I think uh, Conrad Aiken I want to say um, I had to look that one up didn't recognize it, but it had the sound of a, of a line of something else to me. They're great titles. Uh, and the, the last book in the series that makes it a quintet, five books, is An Acceptable Time. Again, a line from the Bible. And this one is kind of cool because um, uh, it is quoted by the Bible quoting itself, which is a thing the Bible does a lot. Um, so, so the Apostle Paul quotes an acceptable time from the prophet Isaiah, and um, and maybe it appears other places in the Bible too. But um, that's what my uh, brief research has turned up for me. So, um, this idea of an acceptable time gets to something that's really interesting. Um, so, it picks back up with this time idea that kind of flows through all the books. Um, and we'll talk more about the different books in the series uh, next time, in two weeks. 
Um, but just to put this out there, uh, there's kind of two notions of time. There's the, the time of events and storytelling, and then there's this idea of the moment in time, the time, uh, the fullness of time, um, the, the kind of critical um, opportunity that you either seize or you let it get away, right? Um, so there's, there's, in English, there's one word for both of those. We just call it time. Although, you know, we have the idea of the moment, which maybe is a little different. Um, but in the Greek, uh, this is a famous thing that people love to point out. Um, the Greek has two words for time, and, and they're, they're distinct. You have the chronos, time, like events and normal everyday time, and kairos, that sort of moment when things are, are coming together for you. Um, the kairos time, I, I think, uh, is, is interesting. Uh, if, if you like um, sort of stories about, um, about saving the world, um, that's something that you'll, you'll come across a lot, uh, that, that critical moment. Um, so, uh, yeah, so we'll talk more about these other books next time, uh, just to sort of indicate again, Madeline Langle is really, really upfront about taking material and adapting it and reusing it. Um, and particularly in this literary way of taking exact words and bringing them into her story. Um, which I think is really cool. Um, it can uh, maybe put some people off. I could see that. Um, but I'm the sort of reader who uh, I don't mind that. I like learning about uh, stuff that's outside of the book. Um, obviously, that's <laughs> what we're mostly doing here, uh, is kind of digging into that. Um, this particularly uh, made some people angry. When the movie came out recently, um, this was a made into a Disney movie, A Wrinkle in Time, um, with, you know, big stars, and uh, they took some liberties with the story, like you do when you change a book into a movie, um, but when they took the character Miss Who and they gave her um, quotes, they updated, you know, they they changed the quotes that she had. And so uh, in doing that, they, I'm, I'm saying they, cause I don't, I don't know exactly who made this decision, you know, somebody at Disney or, you know, whoever is in charge of these things <laughs> when movies get made. But, um, but it annoyed the audience who were really taken with Madeline Langle's original quotes because as we'll see, her original quotes really lead the reader in um, a pretty important direction, um, kind of like C.S. Lewis. Uh, these authors are alike in that they are very interested in the power of stories um, to tell spiritual or religious truths. Um, so I think I'm not trying to say that Madeleine Langle and C.S. Lewis are exactly the same or saying exactly the same thing, um, but they're doing something similar. Um, they both seem particularly interested in religious or spiritual truths, right, with their stories. Um, Disney, not so much. Uh, not in this case or not in the same way, again. Um, so in the movie, some Shakespeare's still in there. Um, we have the quote, when shall we three meet again? That comes from Ham, uh, Macbeth, sorry, Fortinbras was in Hamlet. This is the three, um, weird sisters, the, the witches of Macbeth, um, who have that line. Um, so that, that, that line stays in there because we have the three witches, uh, quote unquote, um, in a wrinkle in time. And we get another Shakespeare quote, which is a good one, um, that love looks not with the eyes, but with the mind. Uh, that one comes from A Midsummer Night's Dream. So again, a pretty appropriate quote for this book or movie in which vision and uh, specifically like 
glasses and spectacles, right, play a big role. Um, but uh, but also love, right? Love is a crucial theme of the book, and Madeline Langle is not shy about putting that right up front for us. Um, obviously, Shakespeare is one of the great poets of making us understand what we mean by love, right? Uh, making us sort of notice when we are being hypocritical or jealous or um, bored even in love, you know? Um, he shows us all of these different aspects of what goes into that word love. Again, famously, the Greek words for love are multiple there's many different words for love. C.S. Lewis has a book about four of them, The Four Loves, which is pretty good. Um, but in Madeline Langle's case, the one word will do, right? And in Shakespeare's case, he informs us what, what that word is all about. Uh, that concept that maybe can't be contained in any one word. Um, that's something we'll talk a little bit more about um, before we leave today. Um, but in the movie, um, they get away from that religious idea of love and they kind of, um, they bring in more cultural and intercultural um, figures. So Khalil Gibran, a, a spiritual kind of writer, Rumi, a Persian mystic poet, outcast, contemporary musician, and the Buddha, and Chris Tucker, and Winston Churchill, and Lynn manuel Miranda are the ones that um, this article I found on Screen Rant uh, cites. So you can see um, there's still some religious figures there, yeah, um, but there's also some um, kind of actors and politicians even um, a little more up-to-date, which is maybe good, um, a little more funny maybe, that's good for the screen, um, but, uh, but also kind of more of a mishmash, um, again, not, not leading us in the way that the book leads us, um, but really kind of scattering us to different, uh, different sources. Um, Again, I think the book is already pretty diverse. Um, it's diverse, maybe not in terms of who the people are in terms of where they come from, but diverse in terms of what they are talking about. And, um, and there's people even who get mad about that. They don't like the book because the book is already too, um, too open. Um, it's not just focused on one religious tradition, but it's open to different religions. Um, the movie takes that a step further, um, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen the movie. I can't. Um, I can't sit here and pretend to critique it too much. But I'm just trying to report um, some of the differences that people have found interesting. Um, so I don't know if you guys have seen the movie Wrinkle in Time, or um, if you have any thoughts about that, that topic for now. All right, do feel free to pop in here and let me know. Right on. So let's look at the, uh, the main topic for today. It's taking me a while to get around to it, but we're doing okay. Doing pretty good. The uh, the Tesseract. All right. So the Tesseract is an idea that Madeline Langle um, takes her title for the book from. Uh, right. So a wrinkle in time is one way to explain the Tesseract. Um, and the picture here that's in my version of the book, and I think most versions of the book probably have this one, um, is like a thought experiment. Um, a thought experiment that the the Mrs. Who's, What's's and Witches are doing with the kids to explain to them how a tesseract works. 
Um, and this is something that Meg's uh, mom and dad have been working on and figuring out. Um, but it's something that the Mrs. Who's, Wets and Witches, can actually do, right? So they move from the theory of it to the practice. They explain it like this. It's a, it's a, the idea of space and time as this, um, this flat surface, uh, like a, like a fabric or like a string, and the ant, walking across the string, can either walk the whole length of the string along the line, or, if there is a wrinkle in that space time, then that ant only has to cross the gap between the two endpoints because it's able to jump over or pass through in some way all of the intervening space and time. Right? So that's what that picture is showing us with the hands with the line in between and then the hands together, the ant crossing them. Um, so that picture in itself is pretty interesting. There's another way the book talks about it in terms of the, um, the space idea of um, dimensions, right? So you have the point, the line, the square figure, and then the cube figure. And then the next dimension would be time, maybe. It's a way to think about it. Um, and then the one after that, the fifth dimension, they say, that's the tesseract. So it's somehow the same way that you unfold a line into a square and a cube, um, a, a square into a cube, you unfold that, you could take that cube and somehow open it up again, right? Um, and, and not simply uh, in, the, in the spatial dimensions that we're able to kind of understand or, or experience again. Um, so this thought experiment or this experience that they're talking about is where this quote comes in. Um, I picked this one partly because it's in Spanish and that's uh, the only other language that I know really well. Um, I've studied it a lot and um, I've traveled a lot in Spanish-speaking countries. Um, so I, I was drawn to this quote and I think it's a really interesting one for the whole story, but um, particularly where it comes in here in the Tesseract chapter. So the quote as given, Mrs. Hu says, La experiencia es la madre de la ciencia. So you can hear it's kind of a rhyme in Spanish. Experiencia, ciencia. And in English, we would say, experience is the mother of science or knowledge, as they translate it. So science in the sense of knowing stuff, right? Knowledge. So experience is the mother. That's interesting partly because the mother figure and the father figure are so important in the story, right? The mother, of course, stays home, doesn't go on the adventure, but she's the one who's understanding the Tesseract. Um, and she and her husband have figured it out enough to the point where he's actually um, gotten lost, right? He's been abducted, um, been captured as he's tessered. Um, and, um, and he's able to test her out again, eventually, when they come to rescue him. So, um, so that whole idea of the mother as the um, caregiver, but also the scientist, right? So that's kind of interesting um, that that idea is connected here. And then the word experience is related to the word experiment, which is what we kind of have shown to us here. Um, so in a way, when we know stuff, when we learn things and find things out, it's by doing experiments, by experiencing um, the effects of our, our theories and our hypotheses, right? Um, we try them out and we learn from what happens. Um, that is kind of in a nutshell what this uh, proverb is about. So it comes from Cervantes and she points this out to us. And if we look at where this comes in, it's in Don Quixote which is a fantastic novel, um, probably the great Spanish novel um, from uh, Cervantes. Cervantes is more or less what, um, you know, he's, he's to Spanish, uh, what Shakespeare is to English, you know, the great literary figure. 
In his case, he writes mostly novels um, and short stories, and Shakespeare writes plays and poetry, but the same idea. Uh, he kind of um, perfects the Spanish uh, language and the idea of what good Spanish is, is kind of comes together, crystallizes in Cervantes. His story, Don Quixote, is a fantastic one about a, an old man who's read too many books of um, knights and princesses and wizards and crusades, right? He's read too many books of poetry, essentially too many adventure books. And it has caused him to think that he ought to go on an adventure himself. He ought to be a knight. Um, the problem is that he lives in a time when there are no princesses to rescue and um, maybe there never was a time, right? These are imaginary stories, but he's going to live them out in his world. Um, so that's Don Quixote. And his faithful squire, Sancho Panza, uh, is very down to earth, thinks his master is crazy, but goes along with it because he thinks he's going to get rich from it, for one thing. So he is kind of carried away by his master's stories. But for another thing, because he serves his master, right? It's kind of a, a Frodo and Sam dynamic a, a little bit there, right? Um, he's loyal uh, to his to his master, Don Quixote. Uh, and they're one of the great uh, friendships or you know, friend relationships in, in literature. Um, so Sancho Panza is normally the one who gives us proverbs in Don Quixote. He's full of them. He's always quoting Spanish phrases. Um, but in this case, it's Don Quixote. He tells them the proverb uh, that um, experience is the mother of the sciences. It's not word for word, but the, the idea is there experience the mother of the sciences um, and he's actually about to tell us another proverb that where one door shuts another opens uh, so in a way this is like a proverb about proverbs um, and he's saying that this is true because their experience is going to prove it because the other day they were fighting against the windmills right this famous uh, image of Don Quixote on his old horse um, charging with his lance at a windmill because he thinks it's a giant um, and that doesn't go well for him uh, but he is not deterred he is gonna he's gonna rise to this new adventure which is the adventure of the helmet uh, <laughs> what he thinks is a helmet is actually a uh, basin like a wash basin um, so Anyway, there's your, uh, there's your Cervantes and Don Quixote lesson for today. Um, it's a funny reference. It's more interesting the more you look at it, I think. Um, and again, it's just, it's just one line in the story, A Wrinkle in Time. But like the Tesseract, right, that one line can, uh, can be this gateway, this uh, wormhole, right, into this whole other world of um, classic literature and uh, Spanish language, actually, right, in this case. Um, so I think that's really cool. Um, if you like A Wrinkle in Time and you like stories of adventure, why not give Don Quixote a look, you know? Um, if you want to work on your Spanish here, what better time? Um, I think it's, yeah, it's it's up there with Shakespeare. It's it's one of the great books, top two or three novels, surely, in in, in all of literature. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so that's at the beginning of the Tesseract chapter. Um, so any any thoughts about Don Quixote and the Tesseract and all that? Send them in. In the same chapter, uh, a whole other world um, is opened up to us. And um, this is kind of pointing us towards 
the uh, the big conflict in the book, right, against the dark thing and against its its agents or its um, people who have fallen under its power, right? Um, this idea of darkness and light is raised at the end of the chapter when they're talking about this conflict. And Calvin asks, who have our fighters been? Uh, Mrs. Who quotes for us their spectacles shining triumphantly. She quotes, And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Which, you can see that's some old English, quote-unquote, right? That E at E, T-H um, is that old form. Uh, this is in many, many translations in slightly different forms. Um, this seems to be an older translation because she likes reading the classics, like we know. Um, and that'd be a good thing to read these days, too. Uh, if you've never read it, the book of John, um, part of the Bible. This line comes early in the book of John in what seems to be kind of a retelling of the creation story. Again, going back to Genesis, the beginning. Um, in John's version of the creation, there is a lot of imagery of light and dark, but it seems to also be talking about a particular figure, um, a figure that the Gospels are interested in, a figure that Charles Wallace recognizes. Jesus, of course, Jesus. The answer to the question Calvin asked is contained in the line that Mrs. Who quotes. He's not named in that line, but in a long, long process of interpreting what these words mean, people are pretty sure that the right answer is Jesus. <laughs> um, other people might disagree. That's fine. Uh, again, um, the Bible is one of those books that gets interpreted in lots of different ways. People take a lot of different meanings from it. Um, but Mrs. What's It agrees with Charles Wallace's interpretation. Of course. Go on, Charles, love. There were others, all your great artists. They've been lights for us to see by. Leonardo da Vinci and Michelangelo and Shakespeare and Bach and Pasteur and Madame Curie and Einstein. Uh, and then they go on and they get pretty worked up and they throw out a bunch of names of famous historical figures, literary figures, artists, and religious leaders, and scientists. Um, so in a very brief space here, we move from this idea of the conflict of the story, right, to this much larger idea of what makes a great genius or a great um, figure a great artist or a great leader, right? These are people who are lights for us to see by. So that goes back to that light shining in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend, right? Did not control or bring it, bring it in. The light is what pushes the darkness back, um, what lets us see despite the darkness. Um, these lights for us to see by uh, are great in the sense that we look up to them, we contain, we, we continue to um, to learn from them, and um, they teach us things that otherwise we would never understand, right? Who could ever figure out that we could sum up the whole world into the little equation E equals MC squared um, and connect mass with the speed of light um, and squared, right? That, that image of making the square and then the cube and then the, the tesseract, right? Um, it's just a remarkable insight. Uh, he gets there by a thought experiment as well um, and by studying a lot, of course. Um, and so uh, these great artists, right? Who could ever have, um, have 
produced something as, as wonderful as uh, the Sistine Chapel or the Mona Lisa or, or these great works, right? Um, it takes um, something something special, this, this light, this, um, this great uh, insight. Um, and yet, what the story shows us um, is that even the, the most uh, kind of everyday, ordinary seeming people like Meg, uh, who she is a great character, but she, but she certainly doesn't think of herself that way, right? She doesn't think of herself as a great genius or artist or anything like that. Um, she thinks she's just weird, right? But Calvin and Charles Wallace and her dad, right? They can see that she has this light in her. Um, and it's really, really amazing to see her finally start to believe in that, right? And, and become this, this hero and, um, and overcome her own uh, doubts and her fear um, and become this, this awesome fighter against the darkness, right? Um, so some people who read the book uh, take A Wrinkle in Time to be playing too fast and loose with these different figures and kind of making them out to be equal or, um, you know, not holding up a figure like Jesus sufficiently uh, respectfully or something, but making Jesus kind of just a great teacher like these other artists um, and scientists. And uh, that offends people in some cases. Again, other people are more offended by the movie because it goes kind of in a different direction and brings in some other... Uh, poets from around the world and religious figures from around the world. Um, you can't please everyone, I guess. Um, for me, the book does a really great job, I think, of, um, well, we'll see this idea of, of fighting back against the forces of darkness, right? It takes help from all kinds of unexpected places, all right? Um, so the, the the way that Meg uh, fights against it is through um, using some of her knowledge, right? Even though it might not be anything spectacular, um, it is her own. It's something she has made her own. Um, and she can kind of call upon it in this critical moment. Uh, it's lines from the Declaration of Independence. What she's doing in that moment is connected really closely with, you know, this idea of independence, right? She's trying to get free. And she is um, not just trying to free herself, but trying to free uh, her father, her brother, her friends. Um, and so she uses the words that she remembers. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The adversary tries to twist those words and suggests, well, then you're in the right place because here everyone is equal, right? And it says everyone here is alike. And she says that's not the same thing. So she's almost kind of pulled in by this false interpretation of the words, right? Um, but she holds on to her interpretation. She says like and equal are not the same thing at all, right? I think that this is a good answer for people who are upset about maybe making religious leaders and artists and scientists all kind of on the same level, um, well, they are in some ways alike or in some ways equal. Uh, and that's kind of the point, right? Um, that is an unalienable truth. Um, or sorry, a, a self-evident truth. It's something we can't deny. Um, that in some sense, 
great people, ordinary people, holy people, and not so holy people are all in some sense equal in the sense that we all have this right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, that's the argument. And obviously, when we read the word men there, we understand we mean all people um, and, and not just male people uh, with property or whatever, right? Um, so we maybe interpret these words a little differently as time passes. That doesn't mean that there's no wrong interpretation of these words, right? Kamazots, a world where everyone is forced to be alike, that's obviously not part of our, uh, of our rights as we understand them um, in the Declaration of Independence, right? Because they don't have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They, they have a kind of uh, fake um, equality, right? And Meg is very passionate about that um, not being the right answer here, right? Um, so anyway, uh, you can take that or leave it, but, um, but I think you could say this to the people who say, you know, putting all of these different thinkers and artists on the same level is, um, is doing a disservice. Well, no, uh, I think we could answer, no, like and equal are not the same thing, right? They are alike in some ways, they are equal in some ways, but they are not being boxed in. Um, and we're still, uh, we're still learning from all of them, but not necessarily treating them as, as equal um, or exactly alike in, in that kind of uh, reductive way, that way of reducing them all. But, uh, yeah. um, but it's not just uh, historical, political, literary stuff. Meg also uses the periodic table of elements and particularly her memory, right, of, um, of learning that with her father, which is this kind of um, key insight to, uh, to the meaning of all this stuff, right? It's not just about memorizing certain words or um, certain elements or knowing the square roots, right? These are things that, again, are, are part of her. They're what make her who she is. Um, her memories of learning this stuff, her knowing that she's kind of a, a great math student, right? She's a great mathematician. That is kind of what makes her special. Um, and that's something that she shares with her dad and her mom. Um, and so there's, there's that kind of connection there too. Um, and so in the very last chapter of the book, um, The Foolish and the Weak, which is another reference to the Bible again, um, Meg goes back uh, after she is almost uh, lost. She goes back and she fights again um, to rescue her little brother this time. Um, and the idea there, again, this kind of this kind of key insight of hers about um, about her uniqueness, what makes her who she is something that she has and it and the dark thing they don't have it right is her love for her family and her friends um, and her love for for learning for math uh, for freedom for pursuit of happiness right for all of this um, that all is what she has going for her right that makes her um, special and yeah, maybe a little weird, right? Uh, but in a good way. Um, and and that maybe even makes her uh, greater, you know, than, um, than some of these other figures uh, if she has the kind of foolishness and weakness that leads her to do something that brave and that... Um, that heartfelt, um, then she's actually a pretty incredible person. Uh, and the book rewards her. It's got a happy ending, although kind of a weird ending, kind of a sudden ending. Um, they make it back home and uh, no time has passed at all, right? She, the moment when they left is the moment when they, uh, more or less, when they come back. 
Um, so it's kind of like uh, going to Darnia, right? Going into this other world. And when you come back to your own normal everyday world, uh, you have learned a lot, right? But the world itself is still there. And you still have to be responsible, right? To return to your life in the world. Um, so I have one more little thing here uh, that I wanted to talk about before we go. Um, again, I'm happy to take any questions, comments, and whatnot. Um, I'll check check back in with you guys there. Um, but this uh, this last topic here is about Madeline Langle again um, herself, and uh, like lots of these authors, um, like Tolkien with his uh, talk on fairy stories and on Beowulf, which were so major, um, and C.S. Lewis has tons and tons of nonfiction um, that's worth reading. Um, Madeline Langle also has done some uh, writing and thinking about the um, the art of storytelling, essentially. And um, and just one of the talks that she's given, um, which I was able to find a little bit of, of quotes from, is called Dare to be Creative. So there's a famous phrase, dare to know, um, and the word in Latin, sapere, is where we get our word for um, uh, homo sapiens, right, for what a human being is. Um, so be, be creative, she says. So take it one step further. Don't just dare to know, but dare to be creative, to make up more knowledge, right? Um, and this is something, um, it might be interesting to kind of compare, contrast her thoughts about this with, say, Tolkien, who is always pretty clear about um, what he's doing is sub-creative, right? He's not really making it up. Um, he's sort of discovering and, and realizing something that's already there, right? So, um, Madeline Langle could be interesting to compare with Tolkien. She could be interesting to compare with Lewis, right? Her concepts about religious and spiritual truth might be different, um, might be similar in some ways to Lewis. I don't know. Uh, again, it's not something I know a lot about, but it's clearly something that would be interesting for you guys out there um, if you want to do some more in-depth research with this. Um, I'm sure that lots of stuff has been written about it already, but that's not quite the same as doing it for yourself, right? That's that's kind of her her point here. Um, it's not about learning and memorizing other people's knowledge, although that's a good start maybe in some cases. It's really about going and and wrestling with questions rather than answers, right? So her quote here, um, the stories I cared about, the stories I read and reread, were usually stories which dared to disturb the universe, which asked questions rather than gave answers. I turned to story then as now looking for truth, for it is in story that we find glimpses of meaning rather than in textbooks. Okay. So this idea that it's in, um, kind of questions instead of simple answers. It's in searching for truth and meaning rather than in, uh, you know, the textbooks you might have in your classes at school. Um, you know, it's in books like A Wrinkle in Time where you're going to find incredible insights. Um, it's not probably in somebody like me telling you all about the book, right? Um, so it's go and read it for yourself, right? Go and read these stories. Read Don Quixote. Uh, read the Bible and the Gospels and all of that stuff. Um, that is where you're going to find meaning. Um, and, and search it out for yourself. Um, right? So if you like telling stories and you like making up stories and being creative, 
awesome. It takes guts. It takes courage to do that. Um, and uh, so you've got to dare to be creative, or as she quotes here, dare to disturb the universe. Um, that's quoting another really famous poet, uh, T.S. Eliot, and his uh, love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. He has this line, do I dare to disturb the universe? Uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic poem, pretty weird. Um, he quotes lots of stuff in it. Um, he mentions Michelangelo. He quotes some Dante at the start of the poem, and he refers to Hamlet and um, um, to the Odyssey. It, it's it's just it's just a wealth of um, of 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 searching for answers right through these great stories and poems. Um, so check that one out if you like that sort of thing. Um, I used to have it memorized, but I have forgotten it. Um, but that's okay, right? We can go back and reread um, and, and learn um, more. We, we, we're going to learn more every time that we read these great, uh, these great works. So um, that's just one little example of uh, Madeline Langle's nonfiction. Um, maybe I'll try to read a little bit more and, and bring back some more of that for next time. Um, we'll also check out some of the rest of her stories um, in the Wrinkle in Time series and the other kind of related um, stories that she's got. Um, so uh, I hope you'll tune back in uh, in a couple weeks here. Um, I hope you guys are taking care of yourselves, being safe, and having fun uh, with the time that you've got at home, probably. Um, you should be able to find some good stuff to read and study and learn. Um, if you like this sort of stuff, do check out Signum Academy's website and our YouTube uh, videos. If you want to get a refresher on A Wrinkle in Time, the course that um, is up there is really great and uh, has, again, some great questions and comments from the, uh, from the original audience. So do check that out. Um, I'll let you guys go. Thanks again for all your attention. And uh, I hope to uh, hear from you. If you have questions and comments, please don't be afraid to send them in. Okay. See you next time.